Hello, Eddie. Hello, Governor. Good to see you today, this afternoon. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us for today's uh, COVID-19 uh, daily update. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by a number of uh, key people that have involved in uh, looking at uh, this from our uh, Economic Recovery Task Force, uh, led by uh, uh, Chair Stuart Walton, uh, to uh, our secretaries that have been uh, head of key subcommittees on that. Our committees uh, work with uh, Secretary Preston and Secretary Hurst of Parks, Heritage, and Tourism, and of course, and joined today uh, by uh, Dr. Nate Smith as well to give uh, that report. I think that covered everybody. Uh, we had our Secretary of Agriculture here, but uh, uh, we had a conference call with uh, the Vice President and Secretary of Agriculture, and uh, he was uh, there on that and took off. Um, yesterday, uh, we had uh, some storm damage uh, in Arkansas last night. I did want to remark that we have 8,500 Arkansans without power on the last report. And uh, I know the uh, linemen, uh, the utility crews are out there working hard to restore that power, but I hope that's able to be done and just wanted to recognize uh, that power outage. In terms of COVID-19, yesterday we had 3,111 cases. Uh, today, there is an additional 81 cases for 3,192. In terms of hospitalizations, our hospitalizations has gone down 11, and so from 104 down 11 to 93. In terms of deaths, we've had uh, seven additional Arkansans die as a result of COVID-19, and of course, uh, our heart goes out to the families in regards to uh, that great loss. We have 59 deaths uh, in Arkansas at the present time. And then we'll go to the charts in our traditional fashion. We have uh, the number of new cases by day starting on, uh, on uh, uh, March 11th and going forward. And you can see uh, where we are uh, today. And, and what's nice is that we, on the tip, we don't have any new cases in Cummings or the correctional institutions. And so uh, the orange reflects uh, where we are with our uh, 70 uh, or 81 new cases today. And uh, then the next one shows a little bit more of the trend line, uh, the seven-day rolling average of new COVID-19 cases. And you see the same bar graph, but you have now the orange line, and you can see uh, what we hope was the peak, uh, which uh, you can see that is April 25th, and it's gone down, and uh, I hope that we stay below that peak. Uh, that's a good baseline for us to look at, and uh, I, I like uh, where the trend line is now uh, on uh, those cases. If you go to the next one, you'll see the same thing in terms of our hospitalizations uh, with what we hope again to see as the peak on that and a downward trend. Uh, this, they're going to go up and down a little bit, but I think that general trend uh, is encouraging news. Today, <coughs> Today, as we indicated, uh, I have uh, two announcements to make today. Uh, the first announcement is in reference to our restaurants that have been uh, challenged. Uh, they've been limited to uh, carry out uh, service, uh, uh, call in service, but not any dine in services. And so, uh, working with the Department of Health, uh, working with uh, the uh, Recovery Task Force, uh, we are now announcing that we're going to open uh, restaurants for limited dine-in service beginning on May 11. And uh, this will cover this a little bit more in detail. We'll issue a directive on this a little bit later today. Again, resuming dine-in operations, phase one on May 11. And I say phase one because phase one is limited to uh, a third or 33 percent of the occupancy rate of the restaurant. And I recognize that 33% is not enough for some restaurants really to cover the overhead on. And I recognize that, we all recognize that, but uh, that's where we need to start at this particular time. And as we keep the trend line successful, then we can go into phase two that lifts the occup occupancy rate uh, to 67%. Uh, and then as we're successful, we can go to full occupancy, but you got to start somewhere. And so we're starting on May 11 with phase one. We'll have physical distancing between patrons and tables. 
Uh, reservations will be encouraged, not mandated, said that fit on every restaurant, but uh, encouraged because that will help reduce the people who are waiting. Uh, face coverings, uh, and this will be applied to uh, the wait staff, but also for the patrons, patrons uh, af uh, until the time that their order is placed. Uh, gloves for staff, daily staff screenings, frequent hand washing, uh, no groups over 10 people, senior hour encouraged, uh, and clean disinfectants to tables. And it says bars and entertainments within restaurants prohibited. Obviously, the bar would be closed, but you're serving alcohol at some restaurants, and so it's open for that purpose. It's just not for congregational purposes. And uh, so that, uh, then if you go to the next uh, slide, you'll see the next phases, which the timeline will be based upon data and how we're doing. Uh, phase two will increase the capacity while maintaining physical distance. And then if we get to phase three, which we all expect we'll do, which is returning to normal operations. And so success brings success. So if we can have this limited opening of dine-in services for our restaurants on May 11, and we're successful in making sure we follow the guidelines and we protect safety, then we're gonna be able to go uh, and go on to more normal operations. We realize that restaurants, small businesses have struggled financially and they've been out of work. They're now having to reconfigure their restaurants in a way that is safe. Uh, they might have to move uh, some of their furniture out, some of their tables out for the new configuration. They're going to have to buy uh, some personal protective equipment for their staff and perhaps even for the customers, they're going to have to do a number of things. And so working with the uh, Department of Commerce, and I applaud their work here, today we're announcing Arkansas Ready for Business. Arkansas Ready for Business grant program. It's a $15 million grant program to assist companies through this restart phase. It's to also to build consumer confidence. As you invest in safety and health, the customer, the consumers will have confidence and they say, yes, this is someplace good to go. We're confident in the health precautions that are there. And so we want to give those kind of grants to help build consumer confidence as well as to help the businesses. It will allow up to uh, $100,000 uh, per company, uh, which will be configured at $1,000 per full-time employee. And this can go back to March 1 to figure the number of employees that they have. Eligible expenses will be the protective equipment, hand sanitizer stations, cleaning supplies, one-time expenses to help them to reopen. And so this is a good program, and again, I applaud Secretary Preston and his team for initiating that. And I would emphasize that this grant program that I just mentioned uh, is subject to the approval of our CARES Act uh, steering group that will be meet meeting later this afternoon and it's also subject to approval by uh, members of the Legislative uh, Council. And so uh, we will follow those steps, but hopefully this will be online and approved. And then lastly, I did want... to show uh, the new logo that uh, uh, Stuart will be talking about a little bit more. Uh, but we are going to be focusing on Arkansas, ready for business, Arkansas ready for business. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to uh, re-engage, uh, to rehire, and uh, start getting back to business in a phased and cautious approach. With that, I'll ask uh, Dr. Smith to come and to uh, make his comments. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I wanted to give a, uh, a few more details on the numbers and then um, uh, some brief comments, uh, particularly on uh, personal protective equipment for restaurants. Uh, as the governor mentioned, we've had 81 new cases. All these we consider to be community. That brings our total to 3,192. Of those, 1,884 are, uh, are active cases. That's actually a decrease of 29 from yesterday. We have one new county, Montgomery County. 
Uh, the governor has already mentioned that we have uh, 93 current hospitalizations. That's a drop of 11 uh, from yesterday. We have 18 currently on a ventilator. That's a drop of two uh, from yesterday. Uh, the governor mentioned that we did have an increase in seven in terms of deaths. We're up to 59 deaths. Of our total deaths, about a third of them have been among those uh, uh, residing in nursing homes. We have 1,249 who have recovered. That's an increase of 103 from yesterday. So we actually had more uh, recovered yesterday than we had new cases. Uh, just an update on our health care workers. We, uh, of our total number of cases, we have 340 health care workers who have been infected. That's up seven from yesterday. Our nursing home residents, uh, 219, that's up 11 from yesterday. And we have uh, 128 nursing home staff, uh, that's up 13 from yesterday. Uh, as the governor indicated, we do not have any new cases at Cummins uh, or um, the other uh, uh, correctional institutions uh, to report. I did uh, promise to give additional information on the Cummins inmates who are hospitalized. We have one who's hospitalized at the field hospital in the Cummins unit, three at UAMS, and seven at Jefferson Regional Medical Center, uh, so a total of 11. And of those, three of them are currently on a ventilator. Uh, I wanted to also uh, give some follow-up yesterday on contact tracing. Uh, I was asked what our current numbers were for contact tracing. Uh, we have currently, as of this minute, 194 who are working on case investigations and contact tracings. The breakdown for that is 85 health department nurses, 16 disease intervention specialists, uh, nine of them are on a special team that does health care associated infections. And that is, those are the teams that are going out to the nursing homes and to the, uh, to the correctional facilities and doing that specialized contact investigations. We have three epidemiologists dedicated to that work, uh, as well as a number of other epidemiologists who support that work in terms of data processing, data analyses. Uh, we have 56 other Arkansas Department of Health employees who have been trained to do contact tracing, and we have 25 uh, uh, students and faculty and staff at the College of Public Health, UAMS College of Public Health. We also have another 60 to 70 Arkansas Department of Health employees who have been trained, uh, and um, uh, we're waiting to equip them with laptops and cell phones so they can uh, pick up the work, and we expect that by the end of next week. We also expect another 125 to 150 uh, College of Public Health students uh, uh, to come on as, as volunteers over the next few weeks after they've been fully trained and employed. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, uh, I get questions about um, businesses, restaurants, what kind of personal protective equipment, PPE, they need. Uh, well, they don't need the entire PPE uh, that, uh, that a healthcare worker would need taking care of a COVID-19 patient. Um, uh, really what they need is, uh, uh, for restaurants, we're talking about uh, cloth face covering, like the one I was wearing earlier, uh, something like this. And, uh, and gloves, and the gloves I need to make a comment on uh, in just a moment, but other types of masks, uh, these are the paper surgical masks, and those would be okay as well, but um, the cloth ones have the advantage of being washable and reusable. And then uh, what uh, restaurant workers and most other uh, businesses uh, do not need, they do not need N95 masks. This is an example of an N95 mask or N95 respirator is the other term. Uh, these uh, really need to be fit tested so they have an airtight seal and uh, they are designed to filter out very small particles um, and these are appropriate for healthcare workers who are taking care of uh, COVID-19 patients or those who uh, may have COVID-19. Uh, my final word on gloves. Uh, gloves are important Important. They're good, uh, but um, just because you have a glove on doesn't mean that you forget about uh, hand washing and changing those gloves. Uh, if you put a glove on and then you don't change those gloves between people or touching different things, um, that's not much better than, than just having your hands bare. So gloves need to be changed between customers or between contacts, uh, or they can be washed. You can wash a gloved hand just the way you can uh, uh, an ungloved hand. But hand washing, hand sanitizing, 
changing gloves or washing the gloves are important. It's not good to put a glove on at the beginning of your shift and use it the entire shift and, and think that you've actually uh, done something good on that. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And I, as Secretary Preston comes up here, I just wanted to recognize him for leading the effort with their team at Commerce on the uh, unemployment insurance, building the program for the pandemic unemployment assistance, then on top of that, serving on our uh, economic recovery uh, task force. And so, been very, very busy during this time. And uh, Secretary Preston, uh, please comment some more about this grant program. Well, thank you, Governor. I appreciate your leadership in, in allowing us to, to think outside the box and get a little, a little creative how we can get some additional support to our businesses. And a big thank you to, uh, to Chairman Walton and the entire Economic Recovery Task Force and uh, our Commerce Committee uh, that uh, are meeting frequently. Uh, we talk about these issues. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, as Arkansas, uh, Arkansas gets uh, back to work and these restaurants and other businesses that have been closed, uh, there's support out there. So one of the, uh, the themes that we kept hearing was consumer confidence. How do we give uh, consumer confidence that they're going to be able to come back and start buying again? But also consumer confidence means uh, do they feel safe to go out? We wanted to make sure that we can help bit, uh, businesses mitigate uh, that risk and that loss. So uh, that's why we wanted to make it so important to, uh, to get these funds out uh, to those who are in need. So if you think of these restaurants who maybe have been closed for a month or, uh, or longer, uh, they're going to need to go through a deep cleaning process. They're going to need to have have um, um, you know, uh, thermometers to be able to scan their employees, to go through all the things to make sure they're meeting the health guidelines that have been set forth. We wanted to make sure that as they were uh, facing this, that they knew that they have a lifeline through the state, they're going to be able to provide these grants. So this is something a, a little different than we did before with our loan program. Uh, we're requiring, uh, obviously, payments back on the loan. Uh, this is going to be a grant to these businesses, and as the governor mentioned, uh, it's going to be $15 million that will be made available. I uh, really appreciate the team at the Economic Development Commission and throughout the Department of Commerce who have been working very hard uh, the last few days to get this program and these applications set up and running. We hope to have our uh, application form uh, via form stack available late this afternoon on our website. You can go to ArkansasEDC.com uh, and you'll see a link there that you can go and fill out that application. Uh, additionally, I'll be hosting a call later this afternoon with our economic development partners around the state to discuss this program so they can help us get that work out and get the message out to those businesses. And again, this is going to be open for uh, all businesses. Obviously, we, we're thinking about the restaurants and the gyms and the salons that are getting ready to uh, open here um, uh, at the governor's uh, urging and, and Dr. Smith's um, guidance that's put out. Uh, but you think about some, some other companies out there who are having to go through a lot of struggles as well, and, and maybe it's a manufacturer who has to now reconfigure their line to set it up in a way that's going to be uh, socially distanced in a way that's safe or that they need to uh, scan their employees that are coming in to work on a processing line. We want to make sure that funds are available to them. So uh, we've set this program up and are excited for uh, the folks to come and be a part of it. Again, you can go to our website, ArkansasEDC.com. You'll see a link there. It will be live this afternoon. Governor, again, thank you for your leadership and allow us to do this. Chairman Walton, for your leadership and bringing the uh, uh, folks together from the industry and all the folks that I talked to within the, uh, the task force who made recommendations and, and gave input on how we can make this the most effective. Thank you, Mike. And whenever we created the Economic Recovery uh, Task Force, I had a vision that's going to be really helpful to us. Uh, everything that's been done has exceeded my expectations. And I applaud uh, uh, Stuart Walton, uh, the chairman of the task force, for organizing it, for spending so much time on it. They've been meeting regularly. I've been getting the reports. It's really extraordinary, some of the counsel that they've been giving and how they're tying themselves to uh, uh, the uh, Department of Health as well. So, Stuart, if you could come and make some comments, and you might have to explain your mask to everyone. I can't read it very well, but uh, you're going to have to explain that. Uh, Rafa is a business that is in the process of relocating its U.S. Uh, headquarters to Bentonville, so I thought I'd give them a shout out uh, today. And this is a hand me down of sorts. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about the process uh, that the task force has been uh, going through, touch base on some of these guidelines that are uh, under development, and then talk a little bit about the, the road ahead in terms of the recovery and reopening of the state's economy. 
Uh, as uh, Secretary Preston said, we've had several different uh, meetings. Um, each committee, I believe, has met at least twice, and some cases more than that. And uh, we've had uh, folks who are not on the task force call in with perspective. Uh, we've had um, uh, Dr. Smith joined one of our committee calls and gave a, a broad update and answered some specific questions that some of the members of the task force had or had been presented. And, um, you know, I think there's a really good network of communication that's being deployed uh, throughout the state uh, and kind of coordinating through the task force and then liaising with the Department of Health in terms of coming up with some of these guidelines to help businesses. Uh, and then these social institutions, community institutions reopen in a safe way. Um, as part of the work of the task force, you know, one, one subset I think of is kind of uh, the guidelines being developed for each industry. Uh, we've got a point of contact within the Department of Health that's helping us uh, create and craft those. They're really uh, governing a lot of what they say. Uh, and then our industry participants are all uh, being very proactive uh, in terms of what the guidelines uh, need to say for their members. I want to recognize Montine McNulty, in particular the restaurant uh, industry. She represents them on the task force and been very proactive with uh, Secretary Hurst's committee. Um, and uh, she was instrumental in getting these guidelines ready today. Uh, all of our work will be posted to a website that's under development. We'll have that address just as soon as it's available. Um, and uh, we continue to uh, make progress. We look forward to uh, getting a number of things up and running by the end of this week and certainly for the May 4th. Um, with respect to reopening business and the road ahead, I just wanted to highlight a couple of thoughts uh, and that, that have become uh, sort of front and center for me. One is that uh, some types of activities will take longer than others to normalize. Um, and I think you'll see that even with some of the first things that we open up or reopen, whether it's restaurants or salons, uh, or gyms, they're gonna be on a different schedule and uh, we're doing our best to be as specific as we can be, but the complexity involved and reopening an economy like this uh, is is surprising to me, and it's uh, it's it's profound. I think there's also a reason for optimism too, because as things are probably not going back to exactly the way they were in January, for example, uh, with that comes some concern, but also opportunity. And our Kansans, I believe, have a, an independent streak, unlike just about any other state. And it doesn't really matter whether you're from the north part of the state or the south part of the state or the central part of the state. It's a, it's a trait that runs through our, our state and our culture. And I think it, it breeds some of that kind of entrepreneurial spirit that the state has in spades, in my view. And so I think there will be opportunity for businesses in the normalization process. And uh, the work of the governor, the work of Secretary Preston to kind of help these businesses uh, get off to a running start uh, with, with this program uh, around uh, Arkansas and ready for business. And that grant program is just really crucial and I think it's really exciting. Uh, looking ahead also, I, I had a chance to visit with Dr. Smith this morning and he shared that in the next three weeks, uh, you know, he expects uh, the, the country to learn a lot about opening up America and described it as a, an information rich three weeks, which I think is is exciting and I think it'll allow us to uh, better inform our own decisions uh, but also uh, move faster where, where we can and where we, where we have confidence that we can do so in a safe way. That being said, I think it's important to remember uh, that this is not a competition against other states uh, to be the first or not be the last, although I'm confident we won't be the last. Um, but each state and, and actually each region and community is different. Um, we can learn a lot from what others are doing and, and we can learn a lot from others that are, that are moving uh, ahead. Um, but we have to make our decisions with our own sets of facts, facts and circumstances that are particular to Arkansas. I think that ultimately uh, the way to think about this is it's a competition against ourselves. It's 
unlike a lot of competitions in that respect, but still, we must move as quickly as we can, as safely as we can. We, as a state, can set the rules. We are competing against ourselves, and ultimately, I believe, we are the judge that matters the most in this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, wise words, uh, and we're happy to take questions now. Will restaurants have to, how do you anticipate governing that overseeing? Will they have to get signed off by health inspectors before, during? How do you see this process work with restaurants? Uh, the, of course, they, they all have a license from the health department to operate, and so they have to follow the health guidelines and uh, the health department has inspectors, but uh, they're expected to follow these guidelines and open up consistent with those uh, guidelines. And of course, the health department will inspect uh, or respond to any uh, complaints or violations that we're aware of. Yes? If restaurants are operating at 33% occupancy, does that mean certain restaurants will be able to have more than 10 people in their dining room? Well, it depends upon the configuration of the dining room itself and the restaurant. But there's, first of all, the limitation that you can't have more than 10 in a group because that's our guidelines in and of itself. Uh, but, uh, you know, so you have to have uh, one third occupancy. And then if your restaurant allows that you could have a table of 10. So it just depends on how it's configured and how that uh, works together for the restaurant. Did I answer your question? Uh, have some governor, or excuse me, if we have some local mayors that say our city isn't ready for this, I'm assuming your, your orders oversee that, correct? Uh, that's correct, but I will tell you that the mayors have been very good partners in this. Uh, I've uh, talked to them frequently. I've talked to a number of them even today, just sort of briefing them what we're thinking. And uh, I think they, whenever they see that it's one-third occupancy, whenever they see the uh, restrictions that are in place, uh, there was a comfort level with that. Uh, obviously, they'll speak for themselves, but uh, it's really important that our state uh, move in harmony, and we're doing that here. And uh, from Texarkana to Jonesboro, I've had uh, good feedback on uh, what we're doing. So tables will be required to be situated at least six feet apart, or what? the groups will have to be six feet apart. So if there's one table, say, with 10, uh, then those individuals have to be six feet apart from another table. Obviously, if you, you and your spouse are sitting together at a table, you don't have to be six feet apart. So it's really a grouping of uh, who's coming in there to sit at a table together. And then the next group has to be 10, excuse me, six feet apart. Yes. Um, with these precautions in place, is, is there still going to be some risk involved for the customer going to a restaurant that they are, you know, could be exposed to the coronavirus? And is, are there any groups of people who still should not go to a restaurant, like if you're over a certain age or have a certain condition? Uh, well, certainly, if you're a, a you know, have vulnerable age, if you've got uh, pre-existing conditions, you want to be extra careful. And you may or may not, you may make a decision not to go out, but to remain in your home or to get carry out. Uh, and so there's that part of it uh, that should be self-regulated by the customer. Uh, but then you also have the establishment or the restaurant itself that will screen. And so, uh, you know, they, uh, would have a sign that would indicate that if you've got a fever, if you've got these, you know, that you, sh you should be screened away. Uh, it's also a screening of employees. And so all of those protections are in place as well as the uh, protective uh, gear. Uh, Dr. Smith, do you want to elaborate on that? I've, I've talked a little bit about this on your turf, and uh, did you have anything to cover there? I think you're covering it well. I think the details will be when you see the, uh, when you see the directive. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, there is a, we've already worked it out. The uh, guideline is ready to go, excuse me, the directive. And so that has more specificity in it than the simple outline that I gave you today. Uh, let's go uh, remotely for a question and we'll come back to the table. Yeah, Andrew, uh, Andrew with, with
with AP. I um, wanted to ask, uh, following up on the issue with cities, uh, now that you're using this back, are cities uh, still going to be allowed to have their, their nighttime curfews? Uh, what, what impact does this have on this? And also, does this have any impact on the uh, rules that were eased regarding uh, allowing alcohol delivery by a restaurant in the first portion? The rules in terms of uh, wine and beer uh, being available at uh, restaurants for carryout would stay the same because you're not going to have every restaurant open up uh, with these restrictions on it. They might continue to rely upon the carryout. And even the restaurants that are open up partially because it's only one third occupancy, they very well will rely heavily on. Uh, their delivery as well, and so those rules will stay into place. Uh, in terms of the curfews that you ask about, uh, you know, we've worked with the mayors, we've asked them to coordinate with us on any, on, you know, on any curfews that have been put into place. I'm not aware of any that's been in, put into place recently because we're starting to see improvement in our, our numbers and, uh, and the control that we have in place here in Arkansas. Uh, as to the lifting of them, uh, we'll work with them as well, but that's been their call and uh, they've coordinated with us very well. Uh, back to the table. Go ahead. Governor, it's getting alarming at the nursing homes uh, with the uh, death count uh, rising today. I wanted to get an idea of your reaction to that and a question for Dr. Smith of what can you do at this point in a nursing home? Uh, my reaction to the numbers of deaths and cases in nursing homes is one of heartbreak, first of all, because uh, these are our loved ones. Uh, they uh, are not able to see uh, visitors uh, in that environment. That restriction is still in place. And then to get ill uh, is uh, additional burden. And so uh, I just applaud again the uh, families that have uh, supported it, the nursing home workers as well, uh, and, and so uh, our heart goes out to all of those families. Uh, with the, as to what can be done about it, I'm going to ask Dr. Smith to come and talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we have had extraordinary cooperation from the nursing homes themselves and a uh, high level of vigilance in terms of picking up on, uh, on the uh, residents or staff who may be ill uh, going in and aggressively testing. Uh, I think that uh, um, the patients who uh, uh, have, have gotten sick and, and then uh, passed away recently are, are ones who were diagnosed uh, uh, some time ago for the most part. Uh, many of the residents of some of, the, of our nursing homes are very, very vulnerable. Some of them are in hospice. And um, uh, so they're very, uh, very vulnerable to COVID-19. Uh, that's why, uh, from the very beginning, the nursing homes and other long-term care facilities have been a high priority for us. And we've had special teams to go in and work with those nursing homes to try and uh, detect those outbreaks and limit them as quickly as possible. Uh, yes, at the table. <laughs> I was wondering if you've changed your position on um, evictions, given the Supreme Court ruling yesterday that applied to those living in federal housing. Um, uh, the Supreme Court ruling, uh, uh, I was not aware of that being issued until it was issued. Uh, that applies to uh, some uh, evictions uh, that have uh, uh, federal funding as its base uh, in federal housing projects and so uh, that stands on its own in terms of my views on it uh, again uh, you know I expect landlords to work uh, uh, in a humanitarian fashion uh, now that the money is starting to flow a little bit more I hope that eases the burden uh, some but uh, we know that they need to be patient uh, but at the same time, uh, the renters, uh, when they have the, the money, they ought to be paying the rent, and I expect that they uh, are doing that. So I'm, I'm relying upon that uh, trust relationship a little bit more, and uh, I want to see that work. Yes? Um, in terms of the uh, guidelines, just the process, were these something that the task force came up with and then 
the health department approved it or the other way around or how does that actually I think it was a, a team effort I mean the uh, health department has the uh, uh, heavy hand in this process uh, because that's the most important criteria uh, but it's important also to hear back from the businesses and the task force that ha leads that discussion as to what do they suggest that they can do reasonably uh, to uh, better protect uh, their workers and their patrons and so it was a discussion back and forth you know, in the final analysis, uh, Dr. Smith and his team uh, drafts uh, the uh, guidelines. Uh, we go over them here in my office and we approve them. And so it's really a team effort. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have uh, both the task force here as well as uh, the health department team here. I think it's been a, a very good team effort. Are there any concerns over liability uh, for businesses opening back up? You know, there's a lot of uh, conversation about that, and I'm going to let Stuart or uh, Mike uh, address that because you've been hearing from uh, uh, some of the uh, small companies about liability issues. Is that right? <laughs> uh, we have. It, it is an issue that we are looking into as, as, in terms of uh, the Commerce Department and the Commerce Committee as, as part of the task force. So I know there's some efforts now uh, on a federal uh, basis on this. Leader McConnell has uh, put forward some uh, proposals that we're taking a look at. We're taking a look at a few other states who have proposed some uh, legislation uh, uh, regarding some uh, liability protection for those businesses that, that do open. But uh, we do plan on making some recommendations as a task force uh, to the governor uh, and to Secretary Smith. Sir, go ahead. Actually, I came up to get my mask, which I forgot earlier. I like it quite a lot. <laughs> but no, I think uh, it, I summarized a few common themes yesterday um, on the task force call that we'd heard across each of the committees. And, and that, that issue in particular was one that we've heard at each, at each, uh, at each committee call. Um, and you know, I think, uh, listen, it's, it's, I, I read something the other day that said it's, uh, we're all in, maybe in different boats, but it's the same storm. And I think that we all have to kind of be thoughtful about the variety of perspectives that are out there. And there's a lot. And, and you also have to, I think, assume at first that people are making recommendations and bringing you information and a perspective that is in the best interest of, you know, society. And uh, we're, we're really trying to take that point of view with the task force and with the recommendations that we're doing. But you can understand that in such an unusual and fluid environment, um, the, uh, the issue of liability is potentially one that could overwhelm somebody's desire to restart their business. I just want to add to that conversation that uh, right now uh, we're looking at the workers' comp laws. We want to make sure that workers are adequately covered in the event they have a uh, COVID, uh, uh, they, they, they become positive COVID and, and, and track that. Uh, and, we, and if there's a causal relationship as to where they work, we want to make sure that they can have a workers' comp claim. And there's some barriers there now. So just we're looking at it both from the employer standpoint uh, and also from the worker standpoint to make sure there's a fair balance there. Yes, ma'am. Concerning liability, do you think it's good public policy to prevent workers from suing employers for unsafe working conditions? Uh, well, I was trying to think, uh, whenever you're looking at unsafe working conditions, uh, that's a responsibility of the Department of Health to make sure that happens. Uh, I don't think uh, we want to get into a, a litigation pandemic. Uh, I think we want to make sure we can resolve these things the way uh, we can keep business going and we can protect the workers at the same time and the patrons. And I think that's through the enforcement of the Department of Health uh, and other uh, regulations pertaining to those businesses. Uh, right now, uh, I, I don't know that there's any change that's needed. Workers are limited in filing suit for uh, a work-related injury. You can't sue them because, you know, a worker fell off a ladder and got hurt. It's a work-related uh, claim that goes through our workers' comp commission. And the whole design is to keep uh, the uh, relationship between the employer and the employee out of the court system and where it can be resolved very quickly in terms of compensation. 
Uh, I'm not aware of how that uh, fits into uh, uh, other kinds of safety claims. I think it would be following under the same guidance that it should be pursued through uh, the Workers' Comp Commission. Extra enforcement agents when it comes to ADH in terms of enforcing kind of the current guidelines with things, or is this just going to be we're all going to sort of police each other? Uh, Dr. Smith, do you want to comment on uh, how this is going to work? Well, for the for the restaurants, it'll be under the same uh, regulatory framework that we currently have. All of our restaurants are licensed; they're regular expect. Uh, uh, inspections and there's also complaint driven inspections if we get a complaint uh, the facility is not following the rules we'll go and investigate that and um, that should uh, we're not anticipating any additional burden because these are all uh, facilities that we license anyhow uh, let's do one more at the table then we'll go remotely yes in Arkansas what's the breakdown between a restaurant and a bar if you simply serve like pizza or consider a restaurant what's that breakdown uh, the uh, directive that's coming out includes restaurants that also uh, contain a bar. The bar will not be opened, although alcohol can be served at the tables. Uh, Freestanding bars are not included in this. Uh, that's a, not a phase one activity in the, uh, in the President's Opening Up America Again plan, uh, but we eventually will uh, plan to open those as well. Is there a, another question remotely? Yes. All right. So I hear I hear the lady speaking. Let's have the lady. Yes. This is E. Calling with the Palm Bluff Commercial. I am calling. Um, the New York Times did an article yesterday ranking Palm Bluff Commercial as one of the top in the nation with daily growth cases of 757 cases, um, doubling every 3.9 days. They also rank Pine Bluff um, in the top relative to cases in death in the last two weeks with 758 cases as where we would have the worst outbreak. And, um, and looking at those numbers, comparing to what the Arkansas Department of Health has us as far as our cases, we only have 162 cases. So can you explain where the New York Times received those numbers and how they came up with that data? Well, I mean, the data itself is uh, through the electronic channels of reporting from all of the different states. But it, so the, the problem is not the data, but it is how uh, they construed it and how they put it together. And so instead of the city of Pine Bluff, they considered the metropolitan area of Pine Bluff uh, in their statistical data, which included Cummins Prison, which included a, uh, a large number, hundreds and hundreds, of uh, COVID positive uh, inmates that is really not part of the Pine Bluff uh, community itself. And so clearly that was misleading. It didn't tell the entire story. I think Pine Bluff has done a very, very good job of responding to this pandemic. You had some of the first cases there, but you have managed it very well, and uh, I think uh, that just was not reflected in the story. Uh, another question remotely. Yes, Jacqueline Sowell with, yeah. so with Public Radio KUAF. Governor, we have 30 Pacific Islanders in Arkansas have tested positive for COVID-19. They're an at-risk population, as you know. Um, we have 15,000 possibly legally present commercially migrants in Arkansas. Adults are ineligible for Medicaid under a 1996 federal prohibition. Kids get our kids, but a lot of Islanders work in the poultry industry. They opt out of workplace insurance. They live conveniently and can spend their money on their family. So my question to you, sorry for the long preface, is that the National Pacific Islanders COVID-19 response team this week, and last week the Arkansas Coronavirus Task Force has called on states um, including Arkansas to dedicate uh, uh, support to uh, Marshallese migrants. Um, in, in Arkansas, that would include the CARES Act. Can a portion of the CARES Act funding, is a portion of the CARES Act funding being dedicated to the Marshallese population, Governor? Thank you. Thank you. It's a very, very good question. And uh, first, we are devoting attention to uh, the Pacific Islanders, the Marshallese population. Uh, Dr. Smith and his team 
uh, sent a health department team up there. We did extensive testing within the Marshallese uh, uh, population. And we're very pleased, by the way, with the results. They had a very low positivity rate. Uh, and, we'll, and we've also devoted uh, funds particularly for uh, marketing, advertising, uh, teaching the social distancing uh, guidelines for the minority populations. And so we'll continue to invest in that. In terms of the CARES Act funding, uh, that is something that is open to uh, CARES Act funding uh, that we have here in Arkansas. And I think we will be looking at uh, whether uh, there can be special attention uh, paid to uh, minority populations, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on them, and any special attention that should be given to them. So that's a, a discussion point. We're open to ideas on that, and we'll see what happens. And then I think it was Neil Gladner that had a question. It was, thank you, yeah. Governor, and I support Dr. Smith. And that is, Dr. Smith, you mentioned the 1,249 people recovered, and you detailed for us before the criteria for recovery. Do those contact tracers keep in contact with the patients who are working toward recovery, or for instance, is the recovery on the honor system? Do they, do they, do you have to take their word that they've been people free for three days? Well, it's a combination. Our contact, uh, our case uh, investigators will keep in contact with those cases and uh, do our very best to ascertain that they have recovered uh, symptomatically. For those uh, situations in which we cannot uh, uh, follow up, uh, uh, the CDC cons currently considers uh, someone who's 10 days out from either uh, diagnosis or onset of symptoms to no longer be infectious. Uh, we're giving it 14 days um, uh, just to be on the safe side. But to the best of our ability, we're trying to actually follow up with those individuals and make sure that they have indeed recovered. Uh, let's come back to the uh, table. Do we have any um, yeah, the uh, cases uh, outside of the prison system um, I think this is the second day when the number of cases was bigger than the day before. Uh, so just wondering if you're con concerned about that. And as we get closer to like this May 11th date, um, if the cases are still looking like they are now, would that be good enough or do you want to see a different like? Well, uh, the, the total cases in the last 24 hours is smaller than it was in the previous 24 hours. So there actually it was a decline in the number of cases. Community cases, yeah, if you look at the community cases, you're right. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a small margin of difference that it upticked. So uh, that's something that Dr. Smith and I talked about earlier. Uh, that's obviously a concern any time that you see any cases that go up. So we'll watch it over a period of time. And, and uh, I expect that uh, uh, you know, when you set a date for uh, May 11, uh, that uh, businesses count on. They're investing in that date. Uh, you don't move it unless you have absolutely no other recourse. And so we'll watch it, but we expect that date to be solid. We, we are doing that uh, partly because there's two reasons I picked or we picked May 11th is one, it takes uh, the businesses some time to uh, get the employees back uh, to do the training, to do the adjustments that are needed. So they needed that lead time. And then secondly, it gives us an opportunity to uh, continue to look at the uh, facts and the data uh, over that period of time. But I expect that to remain solid, but obviously that's why we have phase one, phase two. Uh, you don't go to phase two unless we're uh, making the progress. And so that's the kind of discipline that we'd probably uh, exercise would be not simply going on to the second phase. Yes, ma'am. Are there any specific guidelines for outdoor seating at restaurants? Uh, that is the same. So outdoor seating is allowed. You have the same requirements in place of the six feet social distancing with a protective gear, uh, mask, etc. cetera. Uh, and so those rules are the same, but it does apply. You can have patio seating as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you know if Average number of tests each day is still around um, between 1,000 and 1,500. Uh, Dr. Smith, have you got an answer for that? 
We did have a little bit of a drop off on Monday, which typically happens because not a lot of testing uh, gets done on uh, on Sunday. Um, and uh, uh, our numbers for yesterday uh, was 1,151, and we had a positivity rate of 3.8%. Is there a, uh, we'll take a, one more question remotely, then come back to the table and we'll see if we can wrap it up. So do you have anything remotely? Yes, Governor, hi. Uh, now Dominguez here. It would be any kind of health conditions that restaurants can deny dining service? Are there any conditions in which a restaurant can deny dining service? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, the answer is yes, uh, we actually uh, discussed that. And so, uh, for example, if a patron comes in and refuses to uh, don a mask, to have a mask, then that uh, we're specifically saying that patron can be denied service. Uh, so we want the patrons to be responsible as well as uh, the staff because we want to protect the staff as well as the patrons. So that is a specific uh, reason for a denial of service. Uh, yes. Update on the, uh, the CARES Act funding for medical workers, has uh, have those dollars been doled out, or are we still waiting on some of the red tape on that? Uh, that has been approved uh, by the steering committee. Uh, the uh, so that all is in process. Uh, as to whether it's actually reached uh, the workers yet, I'd have to check. But I know that uh, everything is in gear to actually get that uh, money out the door. Final question. Uh, are you going to be able to be required to wear a mask while eating? No. No. The uh, server will get, will get close to you, but your server will have a mask. Well, the uh, mask requirement will, uh, once the order is taken, then the patron can take the mask off, and obviously you're going to be uh, drinking and eating, and so that is just a necessity. Uh, but, of course, that's uh, after the order is taken. All right, thank you all very much. Hey, Stuart, y'all come. Uh, we'll, we'll do a socially distanced picture around this. How about that? Mask or no mask? Uh,